The scene opens with Claudius, the recently appointed king of Denmark, making his inaugural speech. From this speech, Claudius reveals that he is Hamlet's uncle and brother to the now dead former king. It's discovered in scene one that King Hamlet died, so Claudius has taken over the throne as king of Denmark. And he did this by marrying his late brother's wife and former sister-in-law. This is largely unacceptable and illegal in the 17th century English culture, whom Shakespeare was writing for. Claudius says that while it's respectful to grieve the death of the former king, it's also wise to move on. There are pressing matters at hand. The young Fortinbras keeps demanding Claudius to give back the lands that his father lost to the late King Hamlet. So Claudius decides to send two messengers, Voltamand and Cornelius, on a mission to deliver a ceasefire letter to the current king of Norway, which is Fortinbras' uncle, also known as Norway. Now, Claudius reveals that Norway doesn't really know what his nephew is up to. Claudius hopes that once his ceasefire letter has been delivered, young Fortinbras will be forced to quit pressuring Claudius. Now, Shakespeare has already established some important parallel structure at this point in the play. The main character, Prince Hamlet of Denmark, has recently lost his father and his uncle has become king of Denmark. Similarly, Prince Fortinbras of Norway has recently lost his father and his uncle has become king of Norway. At the same time, Claudius mentions that the king of Norway doesn't really know what his nephew is up to. And as we'll see in the scenes to come, Hamlet's going to be plotting and scheming behind Claudius's back as well. Now, among the many people who are attending this inaugural speech of Claudius, there are a few other characters to take note of as well. First of all, Gertrude, Hamlet's mother, who is also the Queen of Denmark, is present. But also Laertes, Polonius, and Ophelia are in the scene. Polonius is a very important political figure, who can be seen as an advisor or sidekick to the king. He has two children, Laertes and Ophelia. Laertes is in the middle of his academic pursuits in France, and has only come back to Denmark for Claudius' coronation. Thus, he respectfully asks for permission from Claudius to leave the coronation early, so that he can head back to France right away. But instead of simply saying yes and granting this request, Claudius first asks Polonius if it's okay with him. And to that, Polonius doesn't simply say yes either. He actually begs Claudius to allow Laertes to go back to France. Now, this interaction is quite formal and highlights the political nature of both Claudius and Polonius. The king doesn't need to ask his subordinate for permission on a matter that he has absolute authority over. Similarly, Polonius doesn't need to ask for permission on a matter where he's been given absolute authority. But by doing so, both characters show their political competence. Long story short, Claudius and Polonius are both quite the clever politicians. Finally, Claudius shifts his attention to Hamlet. He says, But now my cousin Hamlet and my son. A little more than kin and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I am too much in the sun. Claudius asks Hamlet why he is still upset. After all, he did say in his speech that it was time to move on. He uses the expression, why do the clouds still hang on you? Hamlet cleverly responds by saying, no, I'm not under the clouds. In fact, I'm too much in the sun. And depending on which word is used to interpret the sentence, the meaning changes dramatically. The first and more obvious meaning is like saying, I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm in the sun. However, the second and hidden meaning is that Hamlet is reluctantly obliged to become Claudius' son, as if to say, being your son is too much for me. Throughout the rest of the play, Hamlet shows through his clever wordplay that he's quite the literary genius. 
Now, Gertrude wants her son to stop wearing black. Yeah, she probably feels a little weird that her son is still grieving the death of his father, while she has instead already found a new husband. And she didn't just marry a random new guy. No, she married her former husband's brother, which is incredibly weird for Hamlet, because his mom ended up marrying his uncle. She says, All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Hamlet agrees with this. But right after this, Gertrude says something that really ticks Hamlet off. In reference to Hamlet's grieving over his father, she asks why seems it so particular with thee. Basically, asking why he seems to be having a particularly more difficult time getting over the death of King Hamlet. She didn't mean any harm here, but Hamlet just can't let this slip by. He rebuts by saying that seems is the wrong word here. It's not just that he seems to be grieving, no, he is grieving. Claudius jumps in to say that a son should grieve when his father dies, but to overdo the grieving is just not manly. In filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow, but to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. Before this coronation ceremony, Hamlet's original plan was to go back to Wittenberg where he would resume his academic studies. Although Claudius had no problem with Laertes going to France, he tells Hamlet that he would rather have Hamlet stay with him and Gertrude in Denmark. And once Gertrude asks Hamlet to stay as well, Hamlet agrees. Claudius claims that he's happy to have Hamlet stay, and so he calls upon a party and immediately heads off to celebrate and get drunk. Everyone leaves, except Hamlet. All alone, Hamlet reveals through his first soliloquy that he wishes suicide was not seen as a sin from God. He's extremely upset that his mother has remarried so early and that the marriage was incestuous since she married his uncle. He thinks to himself, how could it be possible that my mother loved my father so much and then somehow as soon as he dies, she just races off to marry my uncle? The thought of all of this makes him extremely angry. Yeah, he's angry at Claudius, but he's perhaps and probably even more angry at his mother. In fact, he's so angry at her that his anger turns to women in general. Frailty, thy name is woman. Why she, even she, within a month, she married with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. Hail to your lordship! Huh, I am glad to see you well, Horatio, or do I forget myself? Remember how the three of them just saw a ghost of the dead former king and decided that they should notify Hamlet? Well, that's exactly what they came here to do. We see that Hamlet has a very close relationship with Horatio. Hamlet and Horatio were basically college buddies. Horatio had originally come back to Denmark to see the late king's funeral, but he definitely got more than what he came for. He saw the ghost of the dead king. And so Horatio tells Hamlet all about how the ghost appeared before their eyes. Hamlet is completely shocked and in disbelief. He agrees to keep watch with him on that very night with hopes to be able to speak with the ghost himself. 